Show us your power, Lord. We're going to open up the heavens today and ask you to come and be with us in this service. All right, if everybody, we could, if you could stand up and praise and worship God with us today. to know that the Holy Spirit is here with us. God, we, we covet your presence. Just be with us today as we sing. We worship you, Father. I count on one thing, same God that never fails not fail me now you will not fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late working all things out working all things out yes I will lift you high in the highest valley Joy, when my heart is heavy for all my 
that never fails will not fail me now. You will not fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. He's working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest. Choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all days. Nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all days. Nothing can stand.
Good job singing, everybody. Good praising God with us today. One, two, three, four, five, six. I've heard you can take what's broken. Thank you. 
Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Reset. Welcome, welcome. Glad you guys are here today. It's, uh, it's exciting to go through this series entitled Reset. Because I really believe we're the church, the evangelical church, the New Testament church, the church that we experience today, the church in America is in desperate need of a reset. And we're going to define what that means. Uh, so let me, let me start off by just saying God is... God is good at resets. Somebody say amen to that. He's good at resets, and he has a default setting for your life. He has a factory setting for your life. He designed you. He made you. He knows how you work best, and he made you with some factory settings. And aren't you glad that God is in the resetting business? Have you needed a reset uh, at some point? Has there been a time in your life when you needed a reset? And aren't you grateful that God in his grace allowed you to have a reset? Maybe you call it a second chance. Maybe you call it something different. And yet, God is always resetting you and I and his church for, uh, for our benefit, for his glory. That, that's the plan. And so now the reset we're talking about, and let me just kind of backtrack a little bit, is not finding a new normal. So if you have a listening guide, write it down, and I hope everybody has one. And, and if I ask you if you don't have one, would you raise your hand? Okay, good. So you're in good shape. So this reset is not finding a new normal. Write it down. But it's about finding a renewed normal. So we're going to look at what Jesus says are the default settings of the church. And we're going to be busy doing that over these next many weeks. And we're going to ask God to reset us to a renewed normal. Last week, we looked at that first command that he gave to the church. And I, I want you to imagine it again. Can't you picture this? Okay, everybody. And Jesus comes along. He says, huddle up, huddle up, listen up. Here's what I want you to do. Listen, don't miss this. Don't do anything. Wow. <laughs> he just said, don't. Here's the first command I'm going to give to the church, and that is don't do anything. So he makes that statement. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wait until the Spirit comes. And then he left. And I think he was trying to teach them something, but, but I think he was trying to teach you and I something as well. And here's what he's saying. And what he's saying is, I would rather you do nothing than to do something without the Holy Spirit. I would rather you do nothing than to do something without the Holy Spirit. This demonstrates the necessity of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so you're going to fail without the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. You're going to fail without the Holy Spirit. The church will not be the church unless the Holy Spirit is reigning and supreme in the church. 
so the takeaway from this last week, and I want to give it to you again. The takeaway is instead of doing good things for God, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to do God things through us. And don't miss that. Instead of doing good things for God, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to do God things through us because that's the default setting of the church. It is to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. This is the way it's supposed to be. And according to Jesus, that's normative for the church. That's the norm. All week long, I've been struggling with this. I I, I have to be honest. I've been praying and I've been thinking. I've been spending some time thinking about this and realizing, you know, we don't spend enough time helping people understand practically what that means. I mean, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And so I can't move too much further. I'm I'm going to introduce really where we're going to be not only today, but as well as next week. Uh, We'll get a little bit of that today. But I have to go back and, and backtrack and look because there's just so much bad theology that's being taught about the Holy Spirit. Listen, it's not some kind of second blessing that comes later. Anybody ever heard that? You get it later. It's a second blessing. You know, if you're, if you're just good enough or if you had enough faith, you get saved. And, and some people teach that, that you're going to get the Holy Spirit later. Or, or they will tell you that if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I want you to listen carefully and don't miss this. Listen carefully to this. It's not in your notes. The very moment you came to Christ... God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit took up residency in your life. Now, somebody say amen to that. You don't have to wait around for the Holy Spirit to come. And and you and I need to get that clear in our mind, that God gives to us his Spirit. The question is not, do you have the Spirit? The question is really this, does the Holy Spirit have you? Because here's the truth. He's resident, but the question is, is he president? And here's the difference. The difference is in the residency of the Spirit, you get the Spirit. But in the presidency of the Spirit, the Spirit gets you. In the residency of the Spirit, you're converted. But in the presidency of the Spirit, you're committed. In the residency of the Spirit, it prepares you to live in heaven. But in the presidency of the Spirit, you know how to live on earth. In the residency of the Spirit, you surrender your soul. But in the presidency of the Spirit, you surrender your life. In the residency of the Spirit, you experience God's pardon. But in the presidency of the Spirit, you execute God's plan. So here it is. It's the difference between salvation and discipleship. So how are you filled with the Spirit? i got to give you the four C's. Are you ready? I'm going to give them to you real quick so you need to listen fast. I, I need these things all the time in my own life. You, you say, well, that's great. Pastor, but what do you do? I mean, you want to talk about being filled with the Spirit. What do you do? I'm going to give you the four things that, I've been, that have been a part of my life for a long time. The four things that I come back to that, 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 that center me. When I began to feel as though I have drifted and I'm leaking and I'm not as filled with the Spirit as I should be, here's the four things that I do. And since Jesus said, this is our default setting, I need this kind of reset. Often in my life, I have a feeling that there might be somebody else here today that understands what I'm talking about, and you too need a reset from time to time. So what is that? And how does that happen? Let me give them to you. You ready? They're in your notes. I confess my sins. You say, well, that's simple enough. Well, is it? Because we don't do it as often as we should. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, then the Spirit of God will not reside where sin is dominant in your life. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, then one of the very first things that you and I are going to have to do is confess our sins. Somebody says, well, I don't have any sin. You're like my my youngest son when when he was coming to know the Lord. And 
And I would question him at an early age because I didn't want him to be confused at all. And I would say to him, he would say, Daddy, Daddy. Oh, and I'd say, Son, do you understand what it means to be a sinner? Do you understand that you're a sinner? No, man. Dad, I'm not a sinner. Well, you're not ready. <laughs> you, you don't get it yet. You, you don't understand that you have a need for salvation because you are a sinner. And once you come to Christ, do you get it? You have a need of cleansing of your sin and purifying from unrighteousness. And the only way you do that is through confession of that sin to a holy father that loves you and is inviting you back into that spirit-filled life that you so desperately need and which is your normal. And if you're not functioning, on normal, then this is the way you start. You confess your sins. Now, there's another one. Let me give it to you. I commit myself to the lordship of Christ in my body. In other words, the Lord is going to be the head of everything in my life. I'm going to commit myself to the lordship of Christ in my body because the Holy Spirit is not going to share the dominant place in your heart. If your job's more important, then the Holy Spirit is not is going to be lesser important. If your relationships are more important, if your hobbies are more important, if your money is more important, if your status is more important, if all of even if your religion is more important, then the Holy Spirit's not going to take up that presidency in your life. Notice what it says. Therefore, it says in Romans 12, 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and that is your true and proper worship. You realize this morning, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you didn't worship properly. <laughs> you didn't really experience worship unless the Holy Spirit is moving in your life. Do you understand this morning? This is not about lectures, and it's not about entertainment, and it's not about singing songs. It, it, it's not, it, that's not what this is about. And without the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life, then you're not going to experience proper and true worship. So I conform. That's the third one. I conform to the word and the way and the will of God. I, I, you, do you want to be filled with the Spirit? Then conform to the Word and the way and the will of God. Listen to what it says in Romans 12, 2. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. But he says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You want to be filled with the Spirit, then you can't be filled with all the stuff in the world. <laughs> Does that make sense? I, I, I mean, listen, he'll have no other gods before him. And if the Spirit of God is going to live as president in your life, then all that other stuff in the world, listen, you cannot be conformed. you got to be confirmed to the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? It says a lot of things. To, to the way of God, walking in His paths and His righteousness, and to the will of God. What is the will of God for your life? It's to be conformed into the image of God's only Son. And so if you want to be filled with the Spirit, that's how you do it. And it's interesting to me. Let me give you another one. I call out in faith. And Paul said, that's how you began your Christian walk in the first place. And I love what he said to the Galatians, uh, to, to those in Galatia in chapter 3, verse 1. And I want to read it for you. You foolish Galatians, who has hypnotized you, who has bewitched you, the King James may say, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was vividly portrayed as crucified. In other words, guys. You knew and saw that Jesus Christ was crucified for you. Who's messing with you? In verse 2, he says, I only want to learn. And I love what Paul does. I only want to learn this from you. And what he was saying is, I can't really figure this out. I already know, and I'm, <laughs> I don't get it. I don't understand why you would forsake him. Notice he says, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or hearing with faith? And he knows the answer. After beginning with the Spirit, are you now going to be made complete by the flesh? In other words, he's saying you can't flesh up commitment. It has to be in the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing. It's a promise power. And here's the evidence. Here's what's going to happen. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then your character will be evidence that the Holy Spirit lives in your life. Your conduct 
your conversation, the converts, people will come and they will see there's something different about you because of the Holy Spirit filling your life, living in and through you. You see, that's the evidence. Years ago, the church I was pastoring decided I, I needed a vacation. <laughs> And so they decided they would pay for my family to go to a little town in Missouri called Branson. You've heard about it, but we had not. We hadn't heard about Branson, and so we were going to go to the big town of Branson, Missouri. We had a blast. Uh, we, we did the bumper cars and ate a lot of pizza and played video games, and, and mostly we were looking for things to do cheap. <laughs> so Waltzing Waters was free. Walton Water's not there anymore because he got blown away in a tornado not long ago. Some of you already know about but at that in that day, it was awesome because, again, it was free. And we were staying in a motel, and walking was free. Waltzing Waters was free. So we did a lot of walking and a lot of Waltzing Waters. I was counting my money, trying to make sure I had enough to get home, and and, uh, you know, I wanted a little ice cream maybe, too, on the way. And we were there for the last day, and I, I reached in my pocket, and I had about $40 in my pocket. And I thought, well, this is the last night, and uh, we were probably walking to Waltzing Waters. Did I already say it was free? And the boys spotted that guy. You know that guy selling those glow-in-the-dark bracelet things? And the dude had them around the boy's arms before I knew what had happened. And they said, Daddy, Daddy, can we, can we please have one of these? Daddy, please, Daddy. And I said, no, you can't. Now, how many of you know the kids can absolutely wear you down? Yeah, don't look at me crazy because I know it's happened to you. Please, please, Daddy, please, Daddy. The guys, then I noticed the guy said, come on, Dad. I wanted to just smack him in the face, but I was a believer, and I didn't want to do that. Well, I did, but I didn't. <laughs> but I looked in my pocket. I did a little math. I'm figuring in my mind. I said, you know, okay. And I said, well, how much, man? How much? How much? They go? Well, there's $3 a piece. I thought, okay, three, let's see, three times three. Uh, don't have to carry anything. Okay, that's $9. Got that? Okay. Uh, well, that leaves me with, let's see, let's do a little math. $31. I figured it would take me about $20 in gas to get home. I thought, well, I'll have a little left, maybe a little money for breakfast and get a biscuit, maybe even a little ice cream. I don't know. Okay. Guys, you can have one. No, no, Daddy, I want two. No, you can have one. <laughs> and they put those glowing things on their arms and and now dad's the hero, right? I mean, I'm the hero. Thank you, dad. Look at my dad. He, he took, and, and, that, and I was the hero all the way up till the time we got back to the hotel. And one of the boys said, it doesn't work. It's not working, daddy. It's not working. Man, I thought, oh, that Yehu, I'm going to go down there and act like I'm not a Christian. I'm going to get this money back. He's going to take care of this. And I thought, you know, uh, I guess the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and said, dude, he gave you some instructions. Read them. So I thought, okay. I pulled out those instructions. I began to read. And I said, hey, boys, hey, hey, give them to me. Dad's, dad's got Call and said, Daddy can do this. Daddy will handle this. Daddy can do anything. And I picked him up. I took him into the bathroom there in the hotel. And about 30 minutes later, I came back out. And they're all shining brightly. And Colin said, I told you, Daddy can do anything. I'm the hero again. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I'm the hero again. Now, I know you're wondering that, what those instructions said, right? So let me just paraphrase a little bit of that. These glow bands do not contain their own light. They contain a luminous material that's placed there by the manufacturer that when it's held next to a primary light source, they will reset or charge back to their original brightness. And so I put them next to the lights in the bathroom, and you know the rest of the story. You see, that's why we need a reset. Listen, that's why the church seems so impotent and powerless. It's because we're not in fellowship with the light. 
John 8, 12 is where Jesus said this. He said, I am the light of the world, and anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have what? The light of life. And so when our light goes out, what do you do? We, we have to fellowship with him. When, when your light goes out and grows dim, what do you have to do? You have to fellowship with him. And, and, and that's not how we do good things. Listen to me. Through the Holy Spirit, that's how we do God things. And that's how it's supposed to be because that's our default setting. So now you're wondering if I'm going to preach today, right? So turn in or turn on your Bible to Acts chapter 1. That's right. Turn on or turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 1. Let's get the picture here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's get this picture. Jesus has just taken his disciples up on the top of the Mount of Olives, and Luke is telling the story. Remember, Dr. Luke, he gives us the setting in Luke chapter 24. Now, if you've been to the Rocky Mountains or the Appalachians or even the Smoky Mountains, uh, you might have the wrong picture here of this Mount of Olives. <laughs> it doesn't look anything like those mountains that I mentioned. It's basically a hill just next to Jerusalem, divided by the Kidron Valley. That's really just a big ditch. And if you go up onto the Mount of Olives, you're going to see lots of olive trees. And you're going to say, well, imagine that. But, but when you're up on top, you get this panoramic view of Jerusalem. And so this is where Jesus took his disciples to have this last conversation with them. I wonder if you can picture Jesus looking out. If he looked over his right shoulder, he would have seen the lamps being lit in the little town of Bethany. Now, you remember that's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. Jesus might have been able to see their house from where he was standing. Can you imagine him thinking, oh, I remember that time that Mary and Martha were so worried and Lazarus had passed, and for three days he, he was dead. And, and then, I, then I came up, and, and I said, Lazarus, come out, and he did. Can you imagine him thinking some through that as he's looking over into that beautiful scene? He might have turned around, and he might have looked at the temple because you couldn't miss it. It stood out, a place where people were busy trying to do the religious things, busy trying to please God, busy trying to do all of the things that, that would make them somehow righteous and look good in the eyes of God. And Jesus, he could see that, and he must have been thinking in his heart, you know, as he always does with his love and compassion, he must have been thinking, I just want you to know life. I just want you to know life. Not the deadness of religiosity. I just want you to know life, life that's abundant, life that is eternal. I just want you to know life. And he could have been looking and observing that and seeing those people come and go, come and go. And, he, and so busy trying to do all of these good things for God. And, and he's just thinking, I just want you to know God. I just want you to walk with me. He might have looked down the slopes and saw the Garden of Gethsemane. It was right, near, right there near the Kidron Valley, full of olive trees, but, but full of a lot of memories for Jesus. You remember? That's where he prayed, agony. Lord, if this cup could pass from me, I'm praying that it would be so. And, and yet, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever it is you've called me to do. I'm willing to go in agony. He prayed, and drops of blood flowed from his brow. That's where Peter cut the ear off of. Malchus, you remember the soldier. And even in his agony, Jesus there heals a man. That's the place where he was betrayed by one of his own. But, but now it's been 40 days since the resurrection, right? And, and he's, he's here with his disciples, and they're on this mountain. Can you imagine Jesus turning around and Looking at those 11 disciples, a motley crew, misfits, a hodgepodge of normal guys. They all speak one language and they don't have any money. Does he think in his mind, these are the guys who are going to take it to the world? Really? <laughs> Could he have looked to the Father and said, seriously? These guys? They're the ones that are going to turn it upside down? Surely, Lord, you've got another way. And you almost hear the father say, son, my beloved son, you're coming on home to sit at the right hand of the father. And then I'm going to send the spirit. 
and the Spirit is going to empower them. But it can't happen with you here. you, you got to come, and then the Spirit will come. Can you imagine that? Thinking through that, and Jesus says this in verse 8. Let's read it. This is our scripture, but you will receive. And this but is very important. We'll get to it next week. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time with it today at all. But, but next week, we're going to look at the problem that arose that, that really precipitates or precedes this entire statement that's made by Jesus. Notice what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You hear what he said? He's going to be my witnesses. By the way, you already know that a witness is someone who shares their personal experience of something. So if you witness a crime, you, you go to court and you tell people what you saw. But he says, this, this isn't like that. He says, you will be my witnesses. You're going to tell people about what you know of me. You, you're going to tell people about the experiences that we've had together. You're going to share this with people in Jerusalem. And you can almost see, could it be that he's pointing out there to Jerusalem? You're going to share this with, look out here, in in, in this panoramic view. You're going to share the experiences you've had with me right here. I mean, we know that probably represents home. It does for you and me, right? It represents a lot of other things. It represents a place of great hurt. Maybe even a place of failure, but that, but that's where you're going to start. You, you're going, and, and then you're then you're going to then you're going to Judea and Samaria. Can you see him pointing out? And then to the very ends of the earth. Look here and there, and even further than you can see. You're going to talk about the cross, and you're going to talk about the resurrection and how I've transformed your life. Verse 8, this is Jesus making a prophecy, a prediction, and here's why. Jesus says, you will. Uh, Underline that if you have your copy of Scripture. You will receive power. The verb, I don't want to get too much of an English nerd thing going on here, but the verb's in the future indicative. It's not an imperative. So, So don't be confused. He's not saying you must receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, we'll get to the great commission. That's over in the book of Matthew. But here, what you have is the great expectation. It's not a command. You must be my witnesses. It's just a statement of fact. You will be my witness. This is going to be normal for you. You will be my witness. This is an expectation because this is who you are. He's describing what's normal for his church, and normal is this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the whole world. And guess what? They got it. (laughs) They did the normal. And the book of Acts proves it in Chapters 1 through 7, you see the church witnessing in Jerusalem. In chapter 8, the church is witnessing in Judea and Samaria. In chapter 9, all the way to the end of the book, you see them witnessing to the very ends of the earth. And he said, this is going to be normal for you. And it was. Johannes Blaw has written a book called The Missionary Nature of the Church, and he said this, In the Old Testament, the people of Israel had a concern for the nations, but they didn't have a mission to the nations. And their, their idea was basically this, we want to be a blessing to the nations, but, but the way we're going to do that is that they will all come to Jerusalem and hang out with us. That's why it says in Isaiah 2, 2, all nations will stream to Jerusalem. We will build it, and they will come. That was their mindset. But in the New Testament, it moves from a concern for the nations to a mission to the nations. This is us being sent out from Jerusalem instead of us hoping people will show up in Jerusalem. See, this is all about it. As you go, making disciples. We, we are a sent people. And Jesus said, you will. But let's be honest, most of us don't. And that's why we need a reset. Because God has a brilliant strategy to reach our city, 
our Jerusalem, our Judea and Samaria and uttermost. He has a brilliant strategy, and the strategy is you. Chris Sonskin in his book, Quit Church, said this. Most of us just hope people will come to church and come to Christ. We just hope they will. There's nothing wrong with hoping people will come. We, we, just, we just hope that they will come. We just hope they'll come to church, and we just hope they'll come to Christ. We just hope they'll get discipleship. Uh, We just hope they'll get committed. We just hope. Again, there's nothing wrong with hope, right? We we believe in hope. But, But then he said, hope is a wonderful emotion, but it is a lousy strategy. You might want to write that down. You see, we can't hope people will show up. You see, we can't hope they'll find Christ, hope their life will be changed by this amazing grace that has changed your life. And Jesus said, this is who you are. His great expectation is that we will connect with friends and family and that we will connect with coworkers and neighbors and people at the gym and people at the grocery store. And wherever we go, we would be going and witnessing of the transforming power of Jesus Christ. So Sonskin said this. He said, less than 5% of people in America have brought someone to church and connected them to Jesus in the last 12 months. And, you know, not to be mean or anything, because this is, this is my, my bad too. But some of us believe it's just the preacher's job. But it's not. As a matter of fact, if you understand the New Testament, and I'll get to this as we continue in this reset of the, of the church, very soon we'll be getting there where I will be able to share with you from the Word of God where I've got a task But you do too. And my task is to help you do your task. The point is this. It's not normal for us to not witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's abnormal. And if it's been a while since you've shared your faith, if it's been a while since you've invited somebody to come and experience the gospel... In this place, that's not normal for you. You see, we need to hit the reset button. Matthew chapter 9, and let me give you this, and and I'm not going to tarry long, but you can get on to this. Say wide awake. Jesus, he sees this man. He's walking along, and he sees this man. The man's name is Matthew, and he's a tax collector, and he's sitting at the tax collector's booth, and he told him, follow me and be my disciple, and he got up. What did he do? He followed him. And then later the Bible begins to record that Matthew is going to have a party and he invited Jesus and the disciples to come to his home for dinner. But then he invited all of his friends. Now you you remember the Pharisees saw that. You know the story. And they asked the question, why does your teacher eat with those scums? And you remember what Jesus said? I love what Jesus said in response to that. He said, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. Isn't that good? Yeah. Let me, let me get practical for a minute. Are you ready? Let's get practical. You might want to write some of this down. What did Matthew do? What, what, what do you see what he did? Well, he, he, did Matthew say, well, you know, I'm just not very outgoing. I'm, I'm really more of an extro, uh, introvert. I'm not much of an extrovert. I don't speak well. I, I'm not a preacher. I, I'm, you know, listen, I'm new at this whole Jesus thing. I, I don't get it. I don't have a lot of this. I don't have a lot of this. I don't know this. I don't know that. I'm too old. I'm too young. I mean, what did Matthew say? He said, I, I think all of a sudden the light bulb came on, and he said, you know, I'm good at throwing parties. <laughs> I can throw a party, and I'm going to invite all my friends, my new friends, and then I'm going to invite all my old friends, and maybe my buddies will meet Jesus. It was pretty simple, really. You know what you might even say? You might even say that's normal, isn't it? But here's what he did, and you need to get these. He did three things. The first thing he did was an invest, an invite, and then he included. The the invest, what what is his circle of influence? I want you to notice what he didn't do. He didn't go door to door. He doesn't get on a soapbox. He doesn't start saying to people all around him, turn or burn. (laughs) 
He doesn't try to debate his way through the religious scene. What does he do? Pretty simple. He looks around at the people who he's already investing in. Who are those people? Those are the people that he works with. Those are the people in his own family. He's already investing with his neighbors and, and, and others. So every one of us, and, and by the way, write this one down. It's not in your notes. Every one of us has a relational equity. Did you get that? You have a relational equity. In other words, God has put somebody in your life. There's somebody in your circle of influence, and they know you, and they trust you. Bring them to church. Bring them to Jesus. That's what Matthew teaches us. There's something else he teaches us. And get this one real quick. And, and, and this one is invite. See, Matthew has some friends, <laughs> some coworkers, some neighbors, and they don't know Jesus, and so he's concerned. He invites them. Again, he didn't tell them to turn or burn. It's just a simple invitation. That's normal. It's normal for you and I to invite people to join us at the church we call home. It's normal. It's, a very no, it's abnormal for us to not share our own church home. Now, what do you do with friends? Hey, come over. I got a new thing. I want you to come over and see it. Hey, come over. I, I want us to spend some time together. It's a very normal thing, right? I mean, it, it's normal for us to do that. We're going to do a very normal thing tonight with our Connect group. And we're going to get together. And, and we've got a good number of people coming, and I'm super pumped and excited. I even invited a, a man and his wife who just moved from Utah not long ago just because I, you know, wanted them to be a part of it. New friends, old friends. And the whole point is, is to point our friends to Jesus and invite them. That, that's a normal thing to do. Invite them, invest, invite. But there's another one, and it's this, it's include. I think one of the best things you and I can do is to get people around some church folks, people that know Jesus. Now, you probably need to stay away from those people who really aren't representing Christ very good. And hopefully that's not anybody in my, under the sound of my voice today. But, but, but now, listen, you might see your pastor do this a lot. If you pay attention, you have. You might see someone, a guest, come through these doors, and you might see me begin to introduce that guest to people. Has anybody ever seen me do that? Yeah, look at that. You know why I do that? It's not because I'm too busy to spend any time with them. It's because I want you to spend some. I want you, I want them to be included in the body of Christ, in the men and women who serve him, know him, and looking for connections with men and women, boys and girls. Why? It's one of the, one of the best things we can do to help people plug in. Because here's what I want you to get. People don't want to just believe. They want to belong. You see, they want to be a part of a community. They're not looking for friendly churches. I don't care how many times they may tell you that. They're not looking for friendly churches. They're looking for friends. Sometimes we get that mixed up. So, so real quick, let's go back to the Mount of Olives. Because I call this the great expectation. Jesus says this, you will be my witnesses. Now that's our reset. That's his church filled with his spirit. Just, what is this? Just a bunch of nobodies telling everybody about somebody who saved us, who transformed us. That's what it is. So how do we do that? We do that filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And there's not a person in this building this morning that cannot be a witness for Jesus Christ. I've said it a lot of times. You are, whether you know it or not, you're, 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 you're either a good witness or you're a bad witness. I was in college and I made friends with a guy here and I nicknamed him Quality. 
You say, well, why? Why did you nickname him Quality? Well, for the life of me, I, I, I don't know why, but every time you would say something to this guy, he would respond with quality, man. <laughs> it's like a real hippie dude, I suppose. And I really liked the guy a whole lot. We had a lot in common. And, and, and uh, so, so, you know, I would get a hamburger, and I'd say, man, this hamburger's really good. I, you know, hey, I took that test and, and today, and, and man, I knocked it out of the park. Quality, man. Quality. Now, quality didn't want to hear anything about Jesus, and if you brought it up, he would say plainly to you, I don't want to hear anything about that. I don't want to hear anything about that. And he's a good ball player, and I played ball with him, and and we could talk about ball all day long, and we could talk about a lot of things all day long. But if you brought up, Jesus, no, 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 man, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to talk about that. And we had a lot of conversations, Quality and I. We talked about a lot of different things. But I decided, well, man, I don't want to, you know, run him off. I'm not going to talk to him about Jesus. And God began to convict me and say to me, Man, you need to talk to him about Jesus. You need to look for opportunities to share the gospel with him. And I kept saying, all right, Lord, I know. I know. I know, Lord. I know. I will. I will. I'm, I'm going to. It was on a Friday night, and the guy came busting through our dorm, and he ran through my door, and he said, man, Turn the news on. Turn the news on. And I turned the TV on. And, and the reporter was giving a report from a scene of an accident on Harrison Avenue. And the reporter was talking about a guy on a motorcycle who was going really fast. He had turned around, not paying attention to the car that had stopped in front of him. Never hit the brake, but he hit the car. His body flew, they said, about 100 feet down the highway, dead when he hit the road. Dead, died instantly. And they were saying the name of the guy. I didn't recognize the name. And my buddy said, that's quality. That's quality. That, that's his real name. That's quality. I got to tell you something. Listen, not to be over dramatic or whatever. I, I just put my hands in my head. I just cried. I just cried. Because I, I should have told him. I should have found those opportunities in those times to tell him. But, but, I was going to. I, I meant well. There's a lot of qualities <laughs> in your orbit. There's a lot of people that don't know Jesus. In your circle of influence, there's people that need to know Christ. This isn't a game. <laughs> his church is his bride. Do you realize, listen, he's not wanting to go steady with you. He's not wanting to date you when you're in town. He's not wanting a one-night stand with you. You are a bride adorned beautifully and filled with his spirit. And a bride makes a commitment. That's why our churches are all jacked up and impotent. Because we don't make a commitment. He said, well, I don't need to commit to the church. Here, his pride. <laughs> this isn't just a building. This isn't just some kind of religious practice. This is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the one whom he said, I am returning for. Wow. But I can tell you, there are times when you leak. I know I do. Holy Spirit. There's times I've been so filled with the Holy Spirit. There's been other times when, I don't know, anybody like me? <laughs> we need a reset. 
I'm going to ask. to have it if you're a visitor or a, a guest uh, if you're a home person or home one of person? our members you're welcome to have this right now media in your possession yeah we really want you to get it it's awesome so please do that secondly because uh, we're going to do about three things real quick secondly disaster relief training is coming up again uh and i've uh, Boy, it's on our website, so go to the website and check it out. September, September it? something, and yes. then October something. Yes. Uh, but that'll be here before you know it. And we highly encourage everyone to go and get trained in disaster I relief. I believe September's in Waynesville, which is not terribly is. far. First Baptist Waynesville, yeah. and then I believe also Blue Springs, uh, Blue, Blue Springs Baptist or First Baptist Blue Springs, something like that, in October. And so let us know. You'll need to go to the website. And when you go to the website, on the home page, uh, about midway down the page, it says Volunteer Disaster Relief. Click that bad boy. And on there, you can get registered uh, to be involved in our disaster relief training. We'd love to see. We've got about a dozen people or maybe a few more who are already trained. And uh, so this is the time to prepare. Uh, there may be some things happen during the fall, maybe not, but most definitely spring, summer of this next year, and, and you need to be trained in order to be ready. I believe you could, you want to go to Colorado right now? You can go to Colorado. You can go to Granby, Colorado. You've just got there. You just got back from Colorado. But, but let's turn around and go back, and we'll go uh, stay at the YMCA of the Rockies. I've been there. It's awesome. So we stay at the YMCA of the Rockies, and then we every day go out and help the people who have lost their homes in the fires. And so we take shovels and we fill uh, wheelbarrows and uh, that kind of thing. Or if, that, if you can't handle that, it's okay. You can go as a trainee with disaster relief and pray with people and uh, help in other ways, all kinds of things to do. So it's, it's pretty cool, pretty awesome. But in order to do that, you'll need to be trained. And we Highly encourage you to do that. Two opportunities this fall, one coming very soon in September. Look at the website for all that information. Number two in October, disaster relief. That's number two. What's number three? Number three is our joy building fund. As a church, let me highly encourage you. Some of you may be new and you're not even aware what that is. Joy, uh, for us, joy building fund stands for Jim Otis Young. One of our uh, dear saints who uh, was, a part, has, was a part of Northwest forever and ever, just one of our stalwart, godly men, and he's in heaven now. And uh, we, we still have a mortgage on this building, <laughs> and, and uh, so we're paying for that. Uh, our payment is around eleven, twelve hundred 1200 bucks a month, something like that. Uh, we have made commitments over the years uh, to help retire that by... <laughs> making a commitment, a monthly commitment to the Joy Building Fund. I believe, Jackie, if I'm not mistaken, there are small cards in the pew backs. Okay. If not, there's some in the foyer, just little small cards that, uh, that you can pray about and say, Lord, how would you have me uh, participate uh, in the Joy Building Fund? I will tell you, we, uh, we had a lot of commitments years ago. <laughs> But then not so much now. Uh, so uh, we have, I believe, presently about $250 committed monthly out of an eleven dollars or $1,200 payment. So as you can see, uh, we're, we're not completely committed to, uh, to the, those numbers. And yet people are giving and continue to give. Let me challenge you to do that. Pray about that. And, uh, and let's be a part of that. That's three things. Anything else? Reset. You want to push the reset button? All right. All right, you ready? All right, we're ready. Ready to reset. <laughs> reset. Reset. Resets are great, aren't they? 